You want to change the world? You want to change the world? Amen. When Jesus comes into your life, changes take place. Transformation happens. We are taken from one way of thinking to another. We are taken from one level to another, from one experience to the other. We are taken to a place in our life that we never thought we would ever get to. When you decide to let Jesus come into your life, change your life, transform your life, things will happen in your life that you never believed could happen. I've said it before and I want to say it again. We are ordinary people called upon by an extraordinary God to do an extraordinary work. When he walked onto the shores of the Sea of Galilee that day and he saw those fishermen, he knew that what was inside of each and every one of those fishermen was potential. They didn't see it until he became part of their life. And once Jesus became part of their life, they recognized what they were able to do through Jesus Christ. And not until you come to that place in your life where you truly understand and appreciate what it means to be a follower and a fisher of men. God will empower you. It's been said that those fishermen, yes, they were good at what they did, but as far as their educational background, for the most part, some had very little and some had none at all. All they knew was hard work and to get to the seashore on that day ahead of everyone else, to get out to the best fishing spot, throw those nets overboard, catch the fish, bring them back to market, and hope the market is good, and hope that there are people there at the market that has money that's able to buy the fish so that they can take the money that they had earned and feed their family. It was their occupation. Not only was it their occupation, but it was what identified them as a person. It's what the community knew them to be. And sometimes today we do the same thing with people who have jobs and occupations. We'll refer to them not by their first name, but often by the occupation that they do. Maybe you come in contact with someone who needs help with their plumbing around the house, and you will say, I know a plumber. And you'll tell this person who the plumber is. Maybe it's a heating and air conditioning person. I know that person. Maybe it's someone who hangs drywall. I know somebody who hangs drywall. They're a drywall hanger by trade. Maybe it's someone who has an office position and you need help because of something you're going through in your life and you try to find the right person who can help you with whatever area in your life that needs help with at the time. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, he transforms lives. And he can change the world with you and with me. God is looking for the available. God is looking for the dependable. He's looking for the person that will allow him to reach into the depths of their soul and change them for all eternity. God can change our attitude. He can change our heart. He can change our spirit. He can change our disposition. And he can change our direction when it comes to where we're going to spend eternity. For the most part, people get up every morning and not think one thing about where they'll spend eternity. But today could be the day that they stand before Jesus Christ and give an account. Things could change during that day. As I look over our church this morning, over the past year, I have been at the bedside with many of you who have gone into surgery. And we prayed that the surgery would be successful. I prayed with some of you over the phone because of a tragedy that came into your life. I've been in some of your homes where you've told me stories that when I left, my heart was beating so fast with compassion for you. And I took my, the, the pain that you have and I made it part of me. And, and I brought that home with me. And for the most part, that night was a sleepless night. But it was all right because joy comes in the morning. See, when Jesus comes on the scene, things change. 
things happen. And for the 12 disciples, their challenge was to turn the world upside down for Christianity, for Jesus Christ, for the church. And ladies and gentlemen, 2,000 years later, we're still feeling the ripple effect of what happened on that seashore at Galilee 2,000 years ago. When those men followed Jesus, they gave up everything to follow him. What are we willing to give up? Sometimes it's difficult even for me to give up maybe a life of comfort. And for the most part, my life's comfortable. Yes, it has its ups and downs, but I would be a fool to stand before you and say that I don't have it pretty good in comparison to how other people have it. And for you, you have it probably better than I do, and others will have it better than you. And then there are those who have absolutely nothing, who wake up every morning not knowing where they're going to get their next meal, wake up the next morning not knowing how they're going to pay the electric bill, Waking up the next morning not knowing how they're going to pay their mortgage. Waking up the next morning not knowing where their kids are, what their kids are going to do. They don't know. There's pain that they live with every day. There's pain that I live with every day. But pain is part of the growing process. And that day that Simon Peter was challenged to give up his occupation and follow Jesus, there was nothing really as far as money that attracted Simon Peter to the cause of Christ, because there was no money involved. Jesus didn't say, follow me, and I will make you wealthy. Follow me, and I will give you riches beyond your fondest dreams. Follow me, and I will take you into caves where I know there is buried treasure. And at any given time, as we're traveling out on the seashore, and we find one of those caves that I believe buried treasure is found in, we're going to divide the loot amongst ourselves. Never was any of that promised. He didn't have a place to lay his head. Jesus didn't. And the disciples, for the most part, had no place to lay their head either. When it came to spending the night after following Jesus, many of them slept outside underneath the moon and the stars. You see, for the most part, we've got it pretty good. See, in the countries where martyrs every day are giving their life for Jesus, they have to die for their faith. But in America, so far, we've gotten it pretty good. All we have to do is live for him. We sang our invitation song a couple months ago, living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do, yielding my life as an allegiance to him. You see, that's what it's about. It's about living for Jesus. I will make you fishers of men. There's one thing that I hope I can do this morning, is I can compel each and every one of you to want to be more of a follower of Jesus Christ, and I hope that you will. Look at this, if you would, please. In the book of Matthew, chapter 4, Begin in verse number 18. Takes us back to the clip we just witnessed a few minutes ago. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship, with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Sometimes it's difficult to give up those things in life which we hold very dear to follow Jesus Christ. Sometimes God expects us to give up an awful lot, Sometimes he expects us to give up little. And believe it or not, I think there are times when he doesn't expect us to give up anything at all. He just expects us to do more with what we have already. More with our talent, more with our time. But think about these guys on that shore that day. They were asked to give up everything. Everything that they had worked for, everything that they had owned. 
everything that they knew about life, everything that they knew about their occupation. When Jesus came on the scene, he said, now, fellas, you have to give it all up. He made it personal. And here's what we're going to do when you give up what you're doing. We're going to radically change the world. We're going to change people's lives. We're going to give them new direction. We're going to give them new insight into life. We're going to share with them the kingdom of God. Fellas, if you follow me, here's what's going to happen. You're going to see things that you never saw before. You're going to see miracles take place before your very eyes. And as they began to follow Jesus, those things which the life of Christ was all about, they watched those things transform before their very eyes. I would have loved to have been one of the disciples the day at the tomb of Lazarus when Jesus came on the scene and Lazarus had been dead for over three days now. And Jesus stands at the tomb of Lazarus and he yells with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out of that tomb. And out of that tomb came a dead man walking. And Jesus said, unloose him. Take the grave clothes from around him. And there they witnessed death becoming life. I couldn't imagine to have been there that day and witnessed that very thing. And by the way, do you know the reason that Jesus personalized Lazarus when he asked him to come out of the tomb? Because if he would have said, come forth, all of the dead in Christ would have came out of their graves. That's how much power our Savior has. What about when he was on the hillside and he fed the 5,000? Don't you think that Simon Peter, when he looked at those little fish that Jesus had, said, that's not enough? Why, Master, we need more of what we had the day that you saw me on the Sea of Galilee. When I cast my nets off into the Sea of Galilee and I brought them up and they were filled, we need that many fish. And Jesus, as he prayed over the little basket of fish and that little bit of bread, and they began to pass it amongst the multitude. Once again, their eyes were opened at the miracle that Jesus had just performed. Do you know that Jesus is still in the miracle working business today? He wants to change your life. He wants to transform your life. He wants to make you an avid follower of him. The only thing that stands in the way is your will to do his will. Could you not say, as he did in the garden, Father, this life is not about me. My ministry is not about me. My everyday living is not about me, but it's about you. I'm not here really to do what Ron wants me to do. Ron's not truly in charge of my life, and I'm not. I'm to watch over your soul. I'm to make sure that the sheep get fed. I'm to make sure that I study and give you what God lays on my heart. But the transformation and the will that you must follow is not mine. It's God's. My responsibility is to cast out the right bait and to throw out the right nets and give you the opportunity to grab hold of and bite onto and sink your teeth into those things which God wants to do in your life. And if you're willing to become a fisher of men, if you're willing to say, Ron, it can be done, then I will do it. You know the day that Jesus walked on the Sea of Galilee and he spoke directly to Simon Peter and Simon reluctantly threw his nets over the boat? It's the same way it is today. It can't be done. Well, you can't build a church. You can't transform people's lives. You can't change people. You can't have crusades. You can't have tent meetings. You, the office of an evangelist, it doesn't work anymore. It works if the people will let it work. Simon Peter had to have the right heart in order for those nets to be filled. And when we possess the right heart with the right attitude and the right spirit, and we rid ourselves of those things in our lives that ought not to be there, that's a deterrent between what we can be and what we are, then and only then will we be able to understand what it means to experience the presence of God in our life and God working miracles in our life. God wants you to throw out the net of life and he wants you to experience happiness and joy and peace and contentment. In regards to our revival, he wants us to cast the net out and he wants you to bring in family members that don't know Christ, the family members that are lost. 
He wants you to bring in people that are cold of heart, callous, that have a callous spirit, and let their lives be transformed again. One of the things that I've learned as a Christian is that I cannot experience my new vision that God has for me if I keep holding on to the old vision. It's been said that the death of one vision is the rebirth to another. And as God has worked in my life and as God desires to work in your life, God wants to bring about a rebirth of a brand new vision and a brand new opportunity to you. When you watched the video clip, did you not see that very thing happen? The death to one vision was the rebirth to another, was it not? Simon Peter, you're going to take those same skills that you've learned all your life and you're going to use those things a little differently now. You're not going to go out and catch fish in the Sea of Galilee. We're going to throw the nets out and we're going to catch souls for the kingdom of God. And as they began to sink their teeth into that, and as they began to think about what God could do in their life, they realized then, little by little, what it meant to be transformed into the image of Christ and to understand the work that Jesus had been called to do. But we all know how things kind of ended up at the cross, don't we? The disciples that loved him, the disciples that he invested his life into forsook him, just like us when we become bitter and we become calloused. We become disillusioned when we lose the joy of our salvation we really don't put as much effort into it like we used to for whatever reason. You know, it's just the person we've become. Well, you know, over the years, and even though they watched the dead restored to life, and even though they watched the 5,000 be fed with just a little bit of bread and a little bit of fish, their lives were calloused. They knew how to work the ministry. They knew how to play their part. They knew how to walk into the different cities and follow Jesus. Why, well, they had done it so many times. They knew how to contain the crowd. They knew how to keep people at bay. Well, they knew the work of the ministry. Well, they had nailed it down pretty good. But what they had allowed to happen was this. What was once something deep-rooted inside their soul was now something that was only surface. And when Jesus needed them the most, they weren't there. But you know what? They finally got it, didn't they? Man, Peter got it. And he turned the world upside down. James got it, and he turned the world upside down. The other disciples got it. Andrew got it. They turned the world upside down. And as you follow the life of each and every disciple, you find, for the most part, that they died a martyr's death because they knew that when they finally gave it all, up to him, what it was going to cost them. Look at this. What does the Bible say? The Bible tells us, and he saith unto them, Come after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. A little different than what Matthew says. Matthew says, Follow me. Mark says, Make me. Sometimes that's a matter of attitude, isn't it? Some will say, you know, Ron's not asking us to follow him. Ron's giving me the idea that he's making us follow him. And I don't like it when anybody makes me do anything. Well, I don't either. Sometimes it's in the eye of the beholder. It's how we perceive the person who's doing the inviting. Mark said, I will make you become fishers of men. Look at this. Now, if you have a pen or pencil handy, and you want to jot down this outline in the back of your bulletin, I would encourage you to do this. Take this outline, pray over this outline, pray over it as you would pray over your prayer card. If we're going to become fishers of men, and our tent revival is going to be successful and God is going to be pleased with it, then first of all, I'm convinced that we, like the disciples, must follow the right person. You agree with that? Every group of people need a leader, correct? God is our leader through Jesus Christ. And we must follow him 
in order to be successful in our Christian life and especially with our revival. Again, notice that these men left everything to follow Jesus. They gave it all up. All of it. Think about it this way. Pretty successful in your life. You walk into your boss's office tomorrow morning and you say, yesterday at church there was a command to follow Jesus. I've been battling this for a while. God gripped my heart and I want you to know that I'm walking out now. You can't do that. You'll ruin the company. You'll bankrupt us. We need time to train somebody else to take over for you. Now, I'm not asking you to do that, by the way. But I'm saying, what do you think would happen at work if you did that? And you said, yesterday, God got a hold of me. He changed me. He transformed me. And I'm going to forsake everything in life, including my employment, and I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. So we must follow the right person. Cult leaders ask you to follow them. I don't want you to follow me. I want you to follow Jesus. I want you to follow the Word. I want you to follow Jesus to the place that you're willing to do whatever it is He wants you to do. Imagine yourself again on the seashore of Galilee, and you're there mending your nets. You're about to go fishing, not for recreation, but to keep food on your table. Not for recreation, but for employment. And Jesus says, I want you to give it all up. A few years ago, there was a man by the name of Don Reed that I came in contact with as a missionary to the Cree Indians in Canada. And he was out of Canton Baptist Temple at the time. And he had this business that he had worked from the time he was in his early 20s, a heating and air conditioning business. And he worked it up to the place that beautiful home, beautiful car, beautiful neighborhood. I mean, he was living the American dream. And Don said, when God called him at one of the missions conferences at Canton Baptist Temple to go to the mission field, to be a missionary to the Cree Indians, he said, I knew that morning that I had to give it all up. And I said, gee, Don, <laughs> are you serious? I will tell you, I did not have that kind of faith then, and I'm not there now. I'm being honest. And I said, how did you give up your work, and how did you give up the business? He said, Ron, you're not listening. And, and he meant this humbly. And the man was sincere. The man was not bragging. The man was the most humble man I think I'd ever been around. He said to me, when I said I gave it all up, I did. I didn't take any money at all from my business. I didn't sell it. I didn't put that money into an account and become a missionary with it. I gave it all up. All of it. I took all the money, put it back into the business, and gave it to my employees so that they could have a job. He said, now very few people know that. Now, foolish? I don't know. For me, I couldn't do it. So yes, it would be foolish for me. For him, it was what he had to do. His point was, if I'm going to follow the right person, then I have to listen to the voice of the right person. And he did it. What a job. What a missionary Don Reed was. Look at this, number two. We must finish the right preparations. The Bible tells us that they were on the shore mending their nets. And when they had gone a little farther, thence he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. Mark 1.19. Now, as a son of a father who taught me hard work from the time I was little until now, that verse struck a nerve with me because... 
when we worked at the house, it was work first, then play later. Okay? So any of my friends that may have came, did you just, uh, Jim? I feel sorry for you, Jim. Did it hurt? Okay. <laughs> no, I'm talking about just the idea that she nudged you. No, I'm just teasing. You work and then you play. And I couldn't imagine somebody stopping by, and I'm not saying that Jesus was about playtime, but I couldn't imagine somebody stopping by and say, Ron, stop working with your dad. You come work for me. And straightway, I give it up. Can you imagine the look on Mr. Zebedee? when he not only lost one son, but he lost two. And they were wealthy people. Give it up? For what reason? Boys, don't you understand? We're one of the most productive businesses that this area has ever seen, and you're giving it all up to follow a man that just came on the seashore, and you don't even really know? But they followed him. We must finish the right preparations. Number three, look at this. We must find the right process. When we think about being one of those individuals that God can call into a service, we have to think about what God is going to do with our life. You see, they were casting everywhere to catch fish. Throwing here, throwing there, throwing over here, throwing here. You know, it's like when you go out fishing, or maybe it's more designed for the younger generation, and you take the kids out fishing, and you have them in a spot where they're throwing in their lines, and the bobber is there on top of the water, and it's just not doing anything. But over there, that's where the fish are. Why, if we were just on that bank, watch those people reel in the fish. Why, if we had a boat, that would make all the difference in the world. Then we could, you know, navigate. We could troll to the right place. Well, no matter where they went, they were not catching fish. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. They were casting everywhere. Sometimes when we cast our line out, we're not very successful that time. You know the days that I wake up in the morning? Let's make this personal. And I'm thinking about everything that has to be done. I'm thinking about so many things that weigh heavily on my mind. And I'm thinking, I've got to get this done, I've got to get that done. And I leave without opening the pages of my Bible or praying. My day's a mess. It's just not good. And I'm reminded, Ron, you started the day out wrong. You've been throwing your nets out. You're not catching anything. You're not doing anything productive because you forgot the most important. And I stop and I apologize because one of the key statements that I make early in the morning is God direct my steps. Take one step in front of the other. God, you navigate me. You place me where you want me to be. Put me where you want me to be today. So when I look back upon this day, I can truly say this is a day that you made. I can now rejoice and be glad in it because you navigated my steps. Well, then when things don't go so good, I'm okay with it because I know that those steps were directed by God. But to know that my steps were not directed by God, oh, the stress, the pressure, the discouragement, the disappointment that sets in, sometimes it's absolutely unbearable. So when I think about these guys casting their nets into the sea, they had to find the right process. They were casting everywhere to catch fish. You know, the best place in the world to start catching souls is within your own family. Your friends, your co-workers, the people whose lives that you're connected with. I remember several years ago, 
I was asked by one of the ladies at the church to pray for her father. He was in the hospital. And I said, well, how about I visit him? Her eyes got that big and she said, oh, she says, I don't think that's a good idea. And I said, well, why isn't it a good idea? Oh, she said, Ron, we weren't raised Baptist. We were raised very strict Catholics. We were raised in Catholicism. And she said, my father would cuss you out when he found out that you were a Baptist preacher. And I said, well, you know what? I understand that. But let's pray about that. Long story short, I went to visit him walked into the hospital room. We began to chit-chat about other things. And I made a comment about one of the religious symbols that he had. And we struck up a conversation then about that. And I said, you know, I said, several years ago, I said, I asked Jesus to be my Savior. And please understand that we connected the dots a little bit at a time. And he said, what does that mean? And I told him. I said, have you ever done that? He said, can't say that I have. I said, what do you think about that? He goes, well, yeah, I'd like to know that. Shared the Bible passages on salvation. He came to know Christ right there in the hospital room. He took the religious artifact that he'd been holding on to, dropped it off the side of the bed, and wouldn't you know, just as I tried to get out the door, in comes his priest. I'm like, oh boy. So he looks over at this man and he says, I'm here today to bless you. And he went, don't need your blessings, I've already been blessed. And he said, I don't need you anymore. I found Jesus. And why didn't you tell me about Jesus? Making the right preparations. Finding the right process. Look at this. Wrapping this up. We must fish the right places. We must go to the right places. We must invest ourselves into the lives of others. And the question is, where are you casting your net? If you're not casting your net, you can't catch anything. Right? You don't go fishing, you can't catch anything. My son Caleb stops by the house the other night, my home, and he has his girlfriend with him, and he said, Dad, we'd like to go back and fish. Well, you know what? I don't know how well he did, but he must have done pretty good. He said he caught a few fish. I think Amber caught more than he did. Yeah, clap for the girls. But there's something about fishing that's relaxing, finding the right spot, watching the excitement come across anyone's face when they feel as though they've latched on to the big one. If we fish in the right places, God will bless us. Amen. And Jesus said to them, come ye after me and I will make you become fishers of men. Look at this. We must furnish the right patience. You ever been out there fishing and thought you weren't going to catch anything? Oh, my goodness, there's nothing any worse than sitting there and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And, waiting and oh, He's trying my patience. There are those who have come to know Christ over the years, not as the result of an immediate presentation of the gospel, but because it took root in their heart, and then it grew over the years. My mom would tell you this story, if she could, about my uncle when I was a young boy, her brother. For the most part, he lived a life that was ungodly. He had gotten to the place to where he had consumed so much alcohol that he had cirrhosis of the liver. And the call came, and he was in Morgantown Hospital, that he was going to die. Dad put us in the car, 
We went to the hospital, and all night long they prayed. I didn't know too much of what was going on. I was a little boy. But here's what I do know, that when the doors swang open, and in walked Reverend Sandy, who was a Baptist preacher, it was as though there was hope in the air. Went to the hospital room to visit my uncle, and believe it or not, the doctor said, the next morning, it's a miracle that this man is alive. You see, Reverend Sandy was able to share the gospel and he got saved. My grandmother, who was a godly Christian woman, said, I want Charles to get baptized. My uncle lived long enough to get baptized. And he got baptized in the river. And so when I hear that song, let's all go down to the river, <laughs> means a whole lot more to me. Shall we gather at the river? It means a whole lot more to me. You see, there is where I had eyewitness of a transformed life. And God wants to transform your life too. Are you willing to let God transform your life? There's no better life than a Christian life. I wouldn't trade what I'm doing for anything in the world. He says, I will make you fishers of men. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. No one looking around. We're going to give our invitation song now. And the invitation song fits well with the message. Jesus is tenderly calling today. He's calling you. He's calling me to a better life. He's calling you. He's calling me to a life of service. Maybe for some of you, a life of surrender. Maybe for some of you, a life that begins with a brand new relationship with his son, Jesus. If you were to die right now, do you know for sure heaven would be your home? If not, we'd love to take the Bible and show you how to be saved, show you what it means to look up verses in the Bible and so that you can come to know Christ. Maybe you just need to spend some time in prayer today. Maybe God's laid someone in your heart this morning that you'd like to see come to our tent meeting, whatever the need may be. God's about transforming lives. Whatever the need may be. Let's all stand this morning. Would you sing with us this morning? Jesus is tenderly calling you home. Calling today. Calling today. Sing with us now. Jesus is tenderly calling you home. Calling today. Calling today. Why from the sunshine of love will you roam? Farther and farther away. Calling today, calling today, Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling.